Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar today. Um, my name is Declan O'Shea, as Linda said, I am the IC um, product manager for Isolator and Containment Systems, ILC Dover, um, handling, you know, sort of day-to-day -day runs of the Isolator portfolio, um, very much working very closely with the uh, with the technical and sales team at ILC Dover to provide active solutions for any sort of pharmaceutical or biopharmaceutical containment needs. Um, you know, and really just get down into the um, to the nitty gritty, really, of, of what is required um, on a containment basis. I mean, today, most likely, the majority of the people here are coming from the biopharmaceutical side. Um, but it is understood more recently that there are a lot more crossovers, let's say, between the two industries, um, namely talking about uh, handling of potent products or, or small molecules inside of the sterile manufacturing system. And <clears throat> what we've been seeing recently is, a, is a, a sharp increase in the use of these potent or maybe hormonal products um, being used inside of the, the sterile manufacturing industry. And that is why um, I've kind of come to you today to, to present uh, sort of my findings uh, over the past maybe 18 months where we've seen this happening and to kind of explain how, how these solutions have uh, well, how these problems have come about and how we're looking towards solving these problems um, through isolation systems and risk assessments. So uh, just to kind of brief roll over what we're going to discuss today, um, we'll kind of review sort of new trends developing in the sterile manufacturing industry. Um, and as I say all this, it's coming from the perspective of, of myself and um, being able to visit and talk with numerous amounts of different pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical facilities. Um, you know, as, as a, a containment systems provider, we're often approached at the beginning of a lot of big CAPEX projects or, or line extensions maybe. Um, and we're always kind of consulted on any form of containment. And this is basically coming from the view that we've seen many different facilities, you know, be it in, in Asia, in Europe, in, in the Americas, you know, we're seeing this trend all over and, and that's kind of, kind of what I'm gonna to bring to you today as, as regard to the new trends. Then I'm gonna kind of deviate a little bit and talk about the potency of molecules inside the pharmaceutical space. It just provides a background context really for anybody that isn't maybe fully familiar with the pharmaceutical environment um, or the pharma space as opposed to the biopharma space um, and small molecules. Um, then talk about a bit more about what we do as containment specialists and how we how we go about creating these sort of solutions and 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 the methods that are used um, in order to really hone down on the environments that you're going to need. And um, then we'll talk about environments specifically, um, and I'll explain what I mean by an environment. Um, a lot of people refer to containment as just a containment system or an isolator, but really, once you understand what I go into. Um, you'll see that we talk about the environment created uh, inside that containment system. And that is really what matters um, in the end. Um, then we'll talk about you know, what this presentation is really about is the handling of, of potent molecules inside these environments. Um, and then what, you know, what the methods are in regards to um, handling them inside the isolation systems, what you have to do outside of the isolation systems. You know, what you have to do in your clean room, what your operators have to be doing, um, what kind of uh, SLPs you have to have in place in order to make sure that you're handling these things safely. Then we kind of think about the considerations to be taken around potent molecules when you're handling them inside these environments, um, namely going down into risk assessments, um, you know, and complying with um, relative guidelines, depending where you are in the world, the majority of people are you know, um, uh, of countries will take a version of uh, EU GMP Annex 1 or the FDA sterile manufacturing guidelines. And then we'll talk about those guidelines um, briefly and, uh, and the referral to risk assessments. Um, and then the final thing I'm going to talk about is new product development. So a big thing that I've been a part of for the past 18 months or so is, is developing new product around this ever-changing market and how we've developed this product in order to really um, hone in on um, uh, to really hone in on the needs and the growing needs and hopefully future needs of of the market, um, and just explain how prototyping um, of 
of any piece of equipment really is is necessary in order to um, to develop a, a product that can work first time, you know, rather than just going in with the you know, sort of doing a project and doing the R and D while you're working, you know, it's really good to to work in conjunction with customers uh, in order to really hone hone down on the exact solution that's needed for the industry. Um, and then we'll look around some of the benefits of of the system, you know, and and where it really applies to each individual that, that has a vested interest. So we'll talk to it from a manufacturing point of view um, rather, than, um, rather than any other. And then we'll talk about it from a quality point of view. As we know, um, in the sterile manufacturing environment, you're always looking towards uh, quality in eh &S, having a very big say in, in the purchase of this equipment and in the running of it. And then we'll also look at it from a, a project management point of view. You know, in the end, these are always usually turnkey solutions, uh, part of a larger project um, involving a whole clean room um, or a whole facility sometimes. And then we'll look around, you know, what what um, what those people are generally looking for out of a project. Uh, just to kind of introduce the, um, the company that, that I work for, it's called ILC Dover. Um, we're a essentially a flexible film manufacturing company. Uh, we manufacture various different products out of, uh, out of a flexible, uh, flexible material, um, namely our own proprietary film. We have representation all over the world. Uh, we have uh, our head office here in the US, and then we have um, other business units um, all over the world, one in Mexico, one in the UK, Switzerland, in India, um, and then in Singapore. And uh, yeah, we, we manufacture and develop and really engineer out, you know, various different solutions for, for the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry. Now the company's been going you know, since 1937, you know, working with the US military uh, in developing uh, materials for them. And then kind of slowly moved on to developing spacesuits. You know, ILC Dover made spacesuits for all the NASA, NASA miss missions. And then moving on from there, moved into the pharmaceutical industry really in the early 90s. And, uh, and that's kind of where it's taken off for, for ILC Dover. And ever since then, um, we've been known as kind of a, a world leader in the market in the flexible film solutions. And one of the first people really to ever take it on board as a fully single use um, solution. So, so we have that good amount of history behind us in order to, to push it forward. So, Talking about the first, the first thing that I was mentioning, you know, going over how the biopharmaceutical world is changing. Now, I doubt I'll be teaching any of you anything new, um, but these are just things that we've seen coming through more and more uh, prevalent uh, over the past few years. Um, cell and gene therapy, without a doubt, is probably one of the largest things in this space. And um, seeing many contract manufacturers moving into this world, hiding and sell things like cell culture media. Um, and then plasmid DNA through to um, the cell and gene therapy market. Um, it's on the rise. Uh, hopefully, it's it's going to be the new way forward with patient specific um, treatments. Um, you know, which moves on to my next next topic is is patient specific products. You know, before uh, the majority of the products that, that are out there on the market, and even still today, are really. Um, you know, a disease or, or infection or, you know, kind of ailment specific, um, but not many really go down to the actual person themselves. Um, but we're seeing more and more of these manufactured uh, drug products that are, that are applying to a specific individual um, rather than a, a broad spectrum um, cure for something. Uh, antibody drug conjugates, you know, some of you here may be familiar with the term ADCs. Um, we as a company, and me specifically, has been highly involved with this market for the past three or four years on the pharmaceutical side, developing containment systems for uh, antibody drug conjugates. Um, and just if anybody uh, really doesn't know, a quick overview, you see the image in the center of the screen there. Essentially, it's a, it's a highly potent mo molecule, um, what we call the toxin payload, uh, that's connected to a monoclonal antibody um, via what we call a toxin linker. So it's, I think it's like a protein strain uh, that essentially allows the toxic um, payload to be attached to the monoclonal antibody without killing it. 
And then that monoclonal antibody goes directly towards the cancer cell. And this is one of the first areas that we first observed uh, the pharma and biopharmaceutical industry uh, working together. Um, I.e., you know, you've got this potent molecule that's that's made on the, the pharmaceutical side. And then once the conjugation process has happened, it goes through your typical fill finish process uh, in a biopharmaceutical facility. Um, and this is where we found the, the handling of potent molecules in a sterile environment uh, first um, was in that, that particular industry because a lot of these facilities were already equipped for fill finish, but they'd never had um, a product of any potency enter the facility before. So a lot of the clean rooms were not set up. For, the operators weren't very confident in handling this product, knowing what it can do, especially ADCs. You're looking down in the in the one nanogram sort of range for a lot of these potent ADC molecules. Um, they're all cytotoxins for the most part. Um, so that's kind of where we came across um, ADCs in, in the start. Uh, looking at potent sterile powders, you know, typically in the biopharmaceutical world, most people um, have only ever dealt with liquids. You know, maybe you dealt with powder products in a previous job or in your facility, you, you might handle um, uh, excipients or, or buffer and media um, in, in a powder form, maybe. Um, however, you never really handed a potent molecule in a powder or a potent powder of any sort. But what we're seeing increasingly across the industry is that these powders are becoming uh, a lot more common that cannot be terminally sterilized or will not be terminally sterilized afterwards. Therefore, the request from a lot of um, manufacturers is that they're handled inside a grade A environment. Um, but you really don't want to handle a potent powder in an open grade A clean room or even inside of a, you know, a rigid uh, containment system as they are often difficult to clean, namely positive in the clean room is high. So kind of handling these, these potent powders um, that cannot be handled in your typical containment, then uh, it's difficult. And lastly, I mean, there's probably some of you on here today that work for contract manufacturing uh, organizations, but real there's a real increase in the use of CMOs and CDMOs uh, across the world. You know, a lot of big farmer at the moment are, are subcontracting out a lot of their um, preclinical and early clinical trial stages, even through to late cl clinical trial with um, CDMOs um, in order to, uh, you know, not have to utilize their own internal space. CDMOs are generally a lot more versatile, a lot more quicker at getting product through, have qualified processes. Um, and the number of these organizations is growing exponentially um, within, within the industry, which is good to see. Um, you know, it's really good that we've got multiple companies with different facets of, of knowledge. And uh, what we find is that there's a, a, usually a very unique difference between all of the CMOs. You know, yes, the majority of them do do the same um, function, let's say. Um, you know, you can all you know, manufactured drug product in one way or another, but you all have a niche, um, which is really good at making you all individual and, and very useful to, to particular companies out there. And um, it's nice to, nice to see that on the, on the rise. Um, so to talk a bit more about potent molecules specifically, you know, the potency in general of small molecules is on the rise. So in, in the past, what you will, um, have seen, you know, the norm um, is sort of, you know, bulk handling of, of lots of powder of a pretty low potency, um, uh, nearly um, in the sort of 100 microgram OEL, 10 microgram OEL, um, you know, was considered potent, or one microgram was considered extremely potent, you know, you'd... Um, you'd be looking at applying some very stringent containment methods around that. Um, whereas now, you know, what we're seeing, and as I was talking about ADCs, um, is that those drug products have got more and more potent over time, where we're looking down at sort of the nanogram range is becoming, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say normal, but a lot more common. And then your one microgram OEL is looking 
looking like the absolute norm. Like we, we as a containment company do now on the small molecule side, really don't deal with anything much more potent than, than one microgram. Um, uh, sorry, much less potent than, than one microgram. So we're, we're really looking at these very high potency molecules that need to have a, a totally different consideration around them because the adverse effects to the operator um, and then your ability to clean and detect um, these products from a cross-contamination point of view is also becoming um, uh, ever more increasingly difficult. So, so yeah, that's that's the general general observation in in that I've seen. You know, from a containment perspective over the last four or five years, more specifically over the last two or three years, um, where where things have got um, got a lot worse. So. To go into, into ILC Dover and, and myself and what, what we have to do with this industry and why I feel I can talk with some certain degree of, of confidence about, about this today is that, you know, containment systems, people or anyone who's providing uh, containment on a, on a project, uh, as I said, these days with so many products requiring containment, we're often one of the first people to be approached. Um, so in the very early stages of development of either a process or a workflow or, um, or the, the thinking about a new clean room, handling a new product, um, we are often approached by, by contract manufacturers or by commercial drug manufacturers um, to have a look around, you know, is and this process possible to contain? You know, is, is it feasible within our room, within our process? to create an environment suitable for protecting both the operator uh, and for protecting the product. And that's kind of one thing that, that you'll hear me talk about a lot in this particular topic is, is operators and product. You know, in, in certain parts of the world, you know, you have a real focus, you know, in the pharma sector, it's namely about uh, protecting the, um, the operator. You know, you're dealing with potent molecules. You know, you're, you're generally, I wouldn't say you're not bothered about the product, but because the way that that product is processed further down the line, you're not that bothered about, about bio burden. You're not that bothered about, um, um, about some airborne particulates. Um, and then go to the biopharma side, it's namely all, all about the product protection. Um, because you're handling a sterile product, you know, the bio burden has to be zero. Uh, microbial growth has to be zero, no particle. Um, no particle um, or high particle counts inside the environment. Uh, and then your operators are deemed pretty much safe, uh, you know, because they, they are dealing with a, a non-potent product. But as that changes, we're going to observe more the consideration to protect both the product and the operator at the same time. And that's where um, risk assessments and, and real in-depth studies of the process come, come involved. Now, as a, a containment specialist, you know, we deal with a broad range of products and processes um, leading to exposure across many industry sectors. Uh, and the reason why I say this is because we, we delve into all different parts of the life sciences sector and then even sometimes outside the life sciences, going towards nuclear, atomic, working with the military, um, you know, for, for uh, hazardous material containment, um, even creating environments uh, for, for some very weird and wonderful processes. And yes, it's not really relevant from an industry point of view that we deal with all these other people. However, you'll find that in other industry sectors that maybe you guys aren't so familiar with or don't have the, the input with, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, is that we can take inspiration from what they are doing in their sectors and cross it over through to life sciences, through to farm and biofarm. And often the approach, um, even though it's a different industry sector, really is the, the same way of doing it. You're, you're either protecting an item or a product or you are tech protecting a person or an operator or, or, um, or an area. So, you know, having this broad range of, um, you know, of custom and of insight really helps us, you know, bring together these, these cross-sectional, uh, cross-functional industries in order to provide, you know, a really in-depth solution. 
Um, and then, you know, segues onto the next point, basically saying, you know, these, this combination of experiences really allows us to develop new and innovative products, um, which work with the ever-changing market. You know, the, the drug market changes, you know, so quickly with many different processes, many different drug products requiring little tweaks in, in the way that they're handled. And by having this many different experiences, you know, we can really develop these new products and, and contain the new and up and coming um, processes that you guys are creating. Um, you know, so in, in our case today, you know, we have the ability to contain, you know, both a, subst uh, a potent substance uh, as well as maintaining that, that sterile environment because we've had those experiences in the past, uh, being able to do, well, we've done one and we've done another on the other side of the fence. You know, how do we now combine those together to make a single solution? You know, and that's been the big question for us over the past, you know, sort of four years of development of this product um, to know that we can physically combine these together to, to propose this solution. Now, I said at the beginning of the slide, um, at the beginning of the presentation about creating environments, and this is really something that I hold, you know, personally, um, a, a personal opinion on, is that we are creating an environment. You know, yes, we're creating a containment system, closed barrier system, an isolator, you know, whatever you really want to call it, um, that's, that's fine. Um, however, every single time your process is going to require a particular environment in order to function. So I've just put some examples in front here of what we're dealing with right now. Um, looking at cell banking, you know, we're dealing with the majority of them are anaerobic environments down to PPM levels of oxygen. Um, you know, and we can create uh, systems which can contain down to those levels. Um, you know, looking at sort of five PPM oxygen levels with inside the, the isolator. And it is an environment, you know, you can't handle uh, the cell culture media outside of that for the most part, um, with, with a lot of these anyway. Um, and then the solution for that, as most of you will probably know, is nitrogen or argon gas saturation, uh, looking at pure nitrogen um, on, a, on purging cycles. Uh, then we've got ADC compounding, talked about ADCs before, you know, you're looking at a high containment system, uh, you're looking at an environment that has zero chance of, of, risk to uh, to leak product from the from the main working chamber out to the external room and operators um, you know so that's a sort of high contained environment which of course we use a closed barrier system for uh, fill finish you know you're looking at sterile environments so we're looking at creating a low particle count um, zero microbial growth um, in a very controlled high laminar airflow and again, it's still an environment. You're creating a clean air environment. Um, and then the final example, um, just kind of get one with humidity in, was sort of dry powder inhalation. Um, you know, you're looking at any sort of inhalers or, or anything that's of a, of a fine powder. You look towards low humidity environments. So much like the anaerobic, you know, we want to remove as much moisture out of the air. And we can do that, again, either using nitrogen, gas saturation, or a cheaper way forward to do it is you, to just use compressed dry air um, will get you down to the sort of sub 1% uh, RH inside of your, your enclosures. Now, in the past, isolators have just been conventional boxes that you just, you know, you have an airtight pressurized box uh, that you can work a process in. You know, you, nothing's going to come in, nothing's going to come out, you know, and they were just uh, basic turbulent airflow units. But the technology's moved on so much so now that we can create all these different sorts of environments um, in order to tailor towards each processes. You know, the, the customers that we see are getting more, um, you know, selective, picky and choosy, um, which is honestly absolutely. We prefer, you know, our customers to be a lot more, um, you know, specific with their requests to allow us to develop exactly what they need rather than going with a, it will do situation you know we don't like it will do situations we like it to be working in, a, in an effective way so you know um it's good that that we're seeing you know the diversity now in the equipment available and the and the methods of manufacturing and to see it all working you know in the end like i'm going to talk about in the end it takes a lot of prototyping a lot of customers willing to to work with us on these new process processes understand we perhaps 
haven't done this in the past before and that this is something new. And as long as we can work together and combine the expertise, you know, with the engineers available in, in um, isolated companies, and I won't just speak for ourselves. I mean, there's some fantastic engineers across all isolated manufacturers um, who can really come up with, with new and innovative um, equipment uh, in order to help you guys with, with your processes. Now to get on to more specifically what, what we're talking about today. Now I've given you all the preamble, you know, and I hope it was it was useful for a lot of you in, in kind of introducing this, this, this space that we're talking about today and why inevitably the majority of you guys are here. Um, you know, to talk about potent molecules inside sterile products or environments. So, you know, are potent molecules new? Um, inside sterile environments no not really you know there's been there's been use of these across the industry in the past um however the awareness around handling them has changed and as i said as the molecules have got more potent in the pharma sector you see that crossover generally happening to biopharma you know a number of years later you know whatever happened in farm generally will happen in biopharma at some point um you know, as the, the upstream and downstream processes um, sometimes collide, sometimes the two industries collide, not necessarily saying oral solid dose and, and liquid injectables come, come into the same being. But, you know, realistically, we are looking at, at, at correlation between the two, the two industries or the two sectors. Um, so I would say no, you know, potent molecules are not new inside the environment, but the awareness around handling them is and the the frequency that we're seeing these being handled is, is definitely something that's, that's new. Um, one question that we get asked very commonly, an assumption that people generally make that is generally false, is that when a product is handled in a liquid form, does the potency of the product decrease? No. You cannot change the inherent toxicity of a drug product. Um, that is always a constant so if you do a toxicology report on a drug product um, it will always come out with the same toxicity of the physical drug product itself what you are considering is the fact that your risk has been drastically reduced um, so the potency of the product inside the drug even though it's now in a liquid form maybe it's even mixed with excipients you know, yes, the, the risk to the operator and the process is a lot lower. You know, being in a liquid form, it can't become airborne. Um, mixed in with a lot more um, bulk product, let's say, you know, the risk of that potent molecule um, coming into contact with someone, again, is a lot lower. But you cannot ignore the fact that the toxicity of the molecule is still there. So if you're handling an OEB5, you know, or a nanogram rated product, that's now in an injectable. Um, yes, handling it inside the environment is easier and the risk is lower. However, there is still, you can't say that there is no risk. Um, so for example, you know, what happens if, um, uh, what happens if the, uh, the, the liquid fill machine breaks, you know, if someone drops a vial inside the isolate um, or inside the clean room? You know, that product is going to land on the floor um, inside of a, a, an isolator where the air is generally cooler, higher airflow. You know, you have a chance of drying that liquid product quite quickly. And then when you dry the product, it then has the opportunity to become airborne. And then even though, yes, mixed in with other excipients, it's not a raw drug form. It still has that potential um, to come in contact with something else that is not um, just the inside of a, a vial or a syringe. Um, as I said, the risk is insanely low. You know, the, the, the risk is, is negligible in a lot of situations. However, you can ignore that risk um, when it comes to some of these products, which will, you know, have serious detrimental effects on any person that would come into to, uh, contact with it, or indeed any other product that may come into contact with it um, from a cross-contamination point of view. So much to the last question there, is the risk the same in all product forms? Um, no. Uh, in a powder form, obviously, it's a lot more higher risk. Um, you know, in a raw drug product powder form, you're in your absolute highest risk category. 
And then you can take it down into further sections about what's the viscosity uh, or the bulk density, sorry, of the physical product itself. You know, is it a very fine, fluffy white powder that's just been micronized? You know, the risk is a lot higher then. Um, or is it some form of wet cake that's that's quite quite solid um, or brick-like? You know, the risk is then lower. And then the risk goes even lower and lower and lower after um, as you, you solubilize it and put it into, into a liquid form. Um, so just to explain some kind of base principles uh, around containment in general, and, and I would hope, and I, I know this from, from you know, friends in, in the industry, just general safe methods of handling potent products um, inside environments. And this can go really for sterile or non-sterile. Um, th there's a lot of key factors that you really should take into account um, in order to maintain these environments properly. You know, the number one is, is safe product entry methods. You know, one of the, I'm, I'm involved in quite a lot of containment testing on the, on the pharmaceutical side. And one of the biggest forms of failing containment testing is entering products into a work system that is already contaminated. So choosing the best uh, and safest entry methods for products into environments is generally a, a big consideration. Majority of the people in the industry will use uh, rapid transfer ports, you know, you can get them from various companies out there. Um, getting are probably being the, the biggest name who, who sells them. Um, and then they can be incorporated into, into containment systems. Um, double HEPA filtered um, exhaust. Um, so, um, double, HEPA, double HEPA filtered exhaust. There we go. Um, basically, yes, H14 HEPA filters have a very high efficiency rating, you know, sort of 99.99997%. Um, and the chance of a HEPA filter failing mid-process um, is extremely low, you know, especially if you are for each operation. You know, that extra assurance of safety to have an additional HEPA filter uh, after the primary, just in implemented when, when handling any potent products. Uh, safe, uh, safe way to remove waste product uh, or waste and product from, from the system. And then passing it straight back out into the clean room. You know, yes, you can clean you know, that product that you're, you're removing out or remove, uh, clean the waste that you're removing. But realistically, you know, how good is a, is a hand clean situation where, where you can physically guarantee that you've removed all elements of the, of the possible particulate on the product before removing it from the containment system. You know, during COVID, we've seen many of these uh, advertisements on, on the, uh, on, online or on TV about people trying to clean their hands, you know, and saying, what is the best method of cleaning your hands? And people will show you by, you know, putting a black liquid on their hands and then, you know, rubbing them all over and says, oh, you always miss a bit if you don't clean your hands properly. So exactly like this, when you're removing something from, um, from a, an isolation system. So in order to do that, you'll generally remove it inside of a waste liner or inside of a secondary container for that then to be further cleaned in, in a different area um, which is also, you know, controlled, might even just be a laminar flow cabinet. Um, but as long as you transport that and remove it from the isolator effectively, then, um, you know, you, you're, you're making sure that you're handling it in a safe way. Um, one way product handling, massive, massive advocate for this. You know, I personally really do not like uh, handling product any other way. You will always take your product into one chamber or in one way, handle it in a dedicated chamber, and then you will pass it out through a dedicated exit waste or, or a, you know, tertiary chamber. You will never use your primary entry chamber for removing material. And the main reason for this is cross-contamination with the room. If you're constantly loading new materials into your entry chamber, you do not want to be putting in um, dirty material, contaminated material, 
um, or, or, or anything of the sort. So as you see in the bottom here, it's an example of an isolator we made before. You know, you have a preparation chamber on the left um, where you will store your inbound materials. Um, and those inbound materials will constantly be coming in throughout the day as the process is run. You have a dedicated filling chamber in the middle, dedicated for filling only, um, keeping all other handling outside of the main chamber, just for particulate reasons. And then you remove it over to the right hand side for capping, crimping, waste and product removal, uh, all handled in a dedicated chamber. So using this one way system is really, um, you know, really advantageous. And then finally, pressure cascades, you know, some might be aware, some may not be aware. Um, but essentially, in order to maintain, you know, a contained environment in, in one chamber, you will have pressure cascades. It works both positive and negative pressure. The whole idea is to keep your most critical chamber at either the highest or the lowest, uh, depending on which way you're doing it. So for a potent molecule, you'll keep the, the, um, the handling chamber at the lowest negative pressure with the chambers on either side being, being at a, a, a higher negative pressure. So like you see in the example here, minus 60 to minus 45. And then it would be exactly the same, but fit around for positive. The whole idea is that you constantly, with a negative pressure, would have an inflow of air from the two side chambers that would flow into the center chamber, meaning that zero airborne particulate from the middle chamber would be able to get to the outer chambers and then vice versa in positive pressure. So you'll have you know, a high pressure in the, in the main chamber and then all the air will flow from that main chamber to the second and third chamber to prevent any airborne particulate getting inside to the sterile environment from the other handling chambers. You know, you're capping and crimping, you don't want any of that airborne particulate coming off the crimps going into your, your currently functioning fill zone. So talk about risk. So one thing, you know, maybe many of you have done it. Uh, I know I did and it was painstaking, but, you know, read through EUG and Annex 1, you know, from cover to cover. It's, it's, it's a really, it's an insightful document. You know, a lot of it for, for us personally, it's not, it's not really relevant, but it's good to know around the, the let's say, beat around the areas of the topic. Um, but more specifically, what I wanted to highlight is that between all of these documents, uh, EU GMP Annex 1, the FDA Sterile Manufacturing Guidelines, and then the various other countries in the world that run their own guidelines, generally they're all along the same sort of measurements. You know, the grade A particle counts all the same. Microbial growth is generally the same. The airspeed, things like that, background environments, you'll see that they're all very common across all, all industries. Um, but the one thing that I've added down here, as you see in the highlighted section, is that you can actually use negative pressure isolator systems inside sterile environments. So a lot of companies and customers we've gone to really were not aware or, or didn't know or, or didn't think that, that you could do this in order to protect your operators. But as long as you're handling this, um, as long as you're handling a potent product and you have a need for negative pressure, um, then you can handle things inside a negative pressure um, system uh, inside, as long as you conduct a risk assessment based on the process that you're running. Now, what I've seen, and I've been on quite a few training courses, seminars, you know, talked to some, some FDA auditors and, and European auditors who go on audit facilities, and realistically, what the industry is about at the moment and what the auditors are saying is that as long as you can risk assess your process um, and your way of working uh, and handling the product that you are handling, um, generally, you will be able to run you know, pretty much whatever process um, you like. As long as you come within the main guidelines that are set in these documents, i.e. the um, uh, zero microbial growth and the particle counts, the airflow speeds, um, and then also the bio decontamination. Um, you know, as long as you can risk assess everything else around that to show that you have done, you know, within your capability and that it is not affected your drug product or operators, you can pretty much run with that process. 
Um, it's not set down to an absolute fine art within these guidelines. As, as the word suggests, guidelines are guidelines. They're not a specific set of rules that you have to 100% you know, go down on. Sometimes your process will not permit to be within these set of rules to a stringent set. But if you've justified and risk assessed that there is no adverse um, impact to your product, process or, or to the patient in the end, then you can run and roll with that process. Um, and that's what I've kind of understood um, from, from the vast amount of, of people that I've sp spoken to about this. And it, it really helps when coming down to these really niche applications of potent products inside sterile environments or various different products inside the environments. Um, Looking at anaerobic systems, for instance, you know we're, we're seeing requests now to handle um, aseptic material or sterilely manufactured material inside very low oxygen environments. Now, that's just not possible inside of your standard high airflow aseptic isolators, because you know often you're you're transferring sixteen hundred meters cubed of air an hour. Um, with a fresh air makeup of 300 meters cubed of hour, an hour of air, nobody can create that much nitrogen in order to maintain that environment. Um, so one thing that you can do is use a turbulent airflow environment, um, still have a 20 to 30 air changes per hour um, system. So you're still maintaining an ISO 5 or grade A particle count. You're just not getting that, that laminar airflow with that airspeed. But as long as you run your process and you can see that there is a grade A particle count maintained, you have zero microbial growth, you've biodecontaminated the enclosure beforehand, and then depending on your product and process and, and the effect it will have, you know, sometimes uh, using these alternative pieces of equipment is certainly possible in order to achieve um, your process. You know, I would always advise you to, to take advice from somebody who does this uh, auditing process themselves or, or work with a, a consultancy company that does it. But I can pretty much guarantee they would speak along the same lines as as long as you can risk assess this process, then then you can go ahead and 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 try doing that as long as it doesn't have an adverse effect to your product or patient. Um, moving on to kind of further considerations that should be should be taken. You know, when when you're looking at doing this sort of risk assessment process, is that you know you want to look um, you want to look specifically at your process. You know, your product specific process. Don't don't try and apply it to a general philosophy. You have to look at this from 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 scratch, and then consider you know what what do I need to do for my product uh, or for my operators. You know, do I need to consider what clean room I'm working in? You know, do I really need a grade A or grade B clean room? You know, can a piece of equipment substitute those higher cost rooms in order to provide the necessary um, background levels that, that I need um, for, for my process? Quite often, you can manufacture drug products inside grade C environments as long as you have a grade A isolator system to work in, you know, with the necessary pass-throughs. Um, you know, so why go for that added gowning, that added corridors? But then on the on the other side of that, you know, if you are working with a negative pressure isolator uh, with a sterile product, I would definitely recommend a grade B or grade A clean room because you're considering taking air in from the room in a in a risk or breach scenario. And you want to make make sure that that is as clean as possible, that it does not adversely affect your process. Um, and then you also have to consider if you're running a potent molecule inside of your clean room, um, what um, risk measures have you taken in case of any sort of catastrophic failure? And, and really, I, when I say catastrophic failure, I'm meaning anything that really bad goes wrong. Generally, if someone spills something inside the isolator or if somebody, you know, drops a vial, or does something small, you know, you can generally carry on with your process, record what's happened. You know, and as long as you've maintained the, um, you know, the main three three observers, um, you can carry on. I'm I'm talking about a, a film machine completely rupturing a line or 
a whole bag of powder splits open or you know you know some adverse effects with the with the equipment shutting down you know those are the situations that are most most likely to be accounted for inside your your risk assessment um then you consider you know how much how much product you're going to be running um generally it's a it's a massive thing uh, if you're if you're considering are you just looking at 10 grams of product you know or two or three uh, liters of product inside of your environment or are you looking at handling you know 10 15 20 kilograms 100 kilograms uh, of product you know the risk is always very different with the amount of product that you're handling at any one time and then if it is larger generally you just have to elongate your process and do it just over a, a longer period of time rather than introducing everything at once you know keep that instance of down um you know and really control the uh, the process that you're working with and then the current state of the product you know you're that's what I'm talking about. Is it a powder? Is it a liquid? You know, is it in, um, you know, is it in a sensitive form? You know, you're really looking at, at risk assessing what happens to the product when you open it up inside that environment. And, and then how do you load it? How do you unload it? Um, and that will all change based on the, the kind of product that you're happening. And then one thing that people don't consider very often, which I find quite strange, is that they don't consider what happens next. So yes, you're always thinking about the process that you're running at the time, but what are you going to do with that product once you remove it from the containment system? So are you going to be taking it to another process within the same room? Are you going to be taking it for a final packaging? Are you going to be taking it out of that room, you know, directly to another clean room or to a warehouse? You know, what are the corridors and the, the transit ways like on the way to that next step you know all those have to be considered when you consider what am i going to be transporting or how am i going to remove this product from the containment system you know if you're if you're carrying it through a, a series of clean room corridors into a warehouse you're not going to take your contaminated product in in a single contained bag um, because the risk that you are going to um, scratch puncture pierce inside a warehouse inside a dirty environment you know, you really need to make more consideration in regards to put it in maybe a, a rigid container or maybe double or triple bagging, even waste product or, or contam possibly contaminated product before you remove it. So consider really what you're going to do next. Um, don't just end your process with what happens inside of the containment system. You know, really consider what am I going to do after this? Um, what am I going to do after this, this product has left the isolator? And that is really a big consideration that, that we advise customers on is to say, you know, really, you know, really think about, about what's going to happen. Um, now, to move on to the kind of final section, um, basically uh, looking at prototyping. So we were, it's funny, our engineers will always say to me that we're constantly giving them like uh, projects which are R&D on the job where it's something that we've maybe not done before. You know, customers got a really niche inquiry, um, but we feel based on our past experience of maybe putting two or three different projects together that we can create their solution. And then it becomes sort of an R&D um, project, let's say. And as long as the customer is, is open to investigating this way of working, you know, usually we're pretty happy at moving forward with them on that basis. And in all honesty, if we didn't do that with customers and if customers were not open to it, you would probably not even get half of the new technology that's available in the industry in general. You know, in order for customers, oh, sorry, in order for equipment manufacturers like ourselves to develop new products, we have to work very closely with the industry to really realize what you guys want and need uh, uh, in order to deliver the right piece of equipment. And that's where prototyping um, really comes comes into into hand. So I'm going to go through sort of three or four different prototypes now um, of our standard uh, aseptic processing system, and just show you how this came along, um, how this came along in the end, uh, in order to be what it is today, and how we worked with the industry to to provide you know all the needs and, and levels of compliance that were required. So 
the first unit you see in front of you, we did it with an American CDMO back in 2016, which is when we first really delved into the sterile manufacturing world. And they were doing um, small uh, hand fill batches um, in a pre-irradiated unit. Um, as you can see from the unit here, it's very simple. It, it gives you some of the basic uh, aseptic containment principles with a laminar airflow um, and, and a small little control system ability to uh, pass liquid through in, into and out of the isolator. Um, we pre-gamma irradiated this um, for more of a bio burden concern, but they were still loading product inside of a grade A clean room. There weren't any pass hatches, pass boxes, you know, they were cleaning everything manually inside, but for, for their kind of early stage, um, I think it was preclinical work they were doing, they weren't too bothered about the high degrees of sterility. Um, it was more for, for testing purposes, but this was kind of the first iteration of, of this unit um, where we could gain this grade A airflow. It was laminar airflow and sterile to a certain extent, but it wasn't really aseptic. And that was kind of version one. Uh, then the following year, we worked with a, a French CDMO, um, the first of two. Uh, this one was in Bordeaux. And this was a more complex uh, process of fill finish uh, of clinical trial products that did need to be uh, aseptically filled. It was going to be used for patients. And this was a CDMO who just worked on a hand fill contract manufacturing basis. And these guys still use the same isolator today um, and still have the, the consumables um, out of it. And they, they do 20 or 30 runs every year um, of hand fill drug process so you're looking at a grade b preparation area to the left with a grade a filling area to the right um and then it's got as you see a more robust structure to the previous unit it's essentially two two of the previous isolators put together with a lot bigger fans valves we realized that we needed to increase the the air speed and the airflow going across the isolators um and then this unit was also gamma irradiated. We, we didn't really have the technology at the time to integrate V to the isolator. They were loading it in for VHP isolator to the left-hand side and then removing the product after fill um, through the right-hand side. So that was absolutely system to this. It's just an on and off button. Uh, with some particle monitoring externally um, and then no VHP integration. Then the isolator after that in 20... Um, the standard pro really started to take shape. Um, and really we looked towards then uh, involving, you know, uh, a, a small PLC driven control system. Uh, this isolator did have the capability to VHP um, inside. We then changed the way the airflow worked. So instead of having a small uh, little area to hand fill drug product in, we created a larger flat work surface uh, in order to place small pieces of uh, semi-automated filling equipment inside. Um, noticing the need for having more products set up inside at one time without having to constantly load, reload the isolator. Um, and we also developed this system to allow a single use uh, gamma, gamma irradiated assembly um, because this customer was handling potent products inside. This is where our first real exposure uh, of handling a potent product. And because we've been single use systems in the pharmaceutical side of the business, we thought yeah, th there's no reason why we can't adapt um, our standard aseptic unit to do the same. So this whole system here is fully disposable in order to uh, leave zero product contacting um, space left. So uh, the plate on the bottom, the filters on the top and bottom are all disposed of in order to, um, to leave you with, with, with zero to, to clean and validate. Um, but in the end, this had, had pretty low levels of functionality. Um, you know, there wasn't a 21 CFR part 11 control system controlling this and the, the VHP generator. Um, and it really had no independent way to load materials in very well. You had to use this, this separate transfer isolator. And that's where we kind of moved on to the development that we're at today. Um, 
I've only got a render in this image. We, we just had the photography done, um, you know, professional photography done a week or so ago. So I put the actual image in, but you can see it on our website. Um, but yeah, this is the final version of the Solo Pure. So basically what we did is we decided to go through a full development process, um, through a stage gating process, if anyone's familiar, it's essentially six or nine months of, of fully developing this product, creating prototypes, uh, putting together engineering, manufacturing, supply chain, um, in order to fully test out this system to make sure that we're providing a product that works right first time. Um, going through FMEA uh, development, you know, failure modes, um, and, and risk assessed analysis with it from an operator perspective, um, from a manufacturing perspective to ensure that, you know, there, there will be no failures when this thing finally goes into a clean room. And realistically, when you're looking at purchasing a product, you, you should really know that it has gone through rugged uh, and rigor, sorry, rigorous testing methods prior to you, to you receiving the, the unit. Uh, third party validation, you know, I would, unless you have a very robust um, testing system in-house, um, a lot of the large commercial manufacturers will, will usually have this in-house, but working with a third party validation company really does give you a lot of insight into um, the nuances of what auditors will come and look at you for. So the way we had our equipment third party validated was by a company called CAI who are um, independent auditors themselves. And they came and uh, tested and validated our system from an audit worthy perspective. Um, so we know essentially once this equipment goes into someone's facility, if an auditor was to come across it with all the relevant documentation, you know, and criteria for this to, to pass audit checks is, you know, without any, any, um, any problems. And then the final thing was a, uh, 21 CFR part 11 control system. Um, data integrity is the biggest, I would say the biggest thing in the industry at the moment, as far as a compliance perspective goes. Any biopharmaceutical facility, even some of the pharmaceutical facilities now employ 21 CFR part 11 um, with data integrity back to a data historian locally. And to have that as an onboard system that will record and measure um, all of the uh, independent going on inside the isolator. So the airflow, um, the airflow, the pressure, the temperature, the humidity, um, and just ensuring that, that the system is running as it should be. Um, and then having that as kind of batch traceable um, records back to each of your uh, each of your products or batches of product that have been made. And then my final little, little slide here is basically just about the benefits of, of the unit itself. You know, it, it's an efficient unit to use, you know, trying to maximize, comp, um, maximize productivity is essentially what you're looking to get out of a clean room. Um, you know, you're gonna wanna utilize every little bit of space you have. You know, we've been noticing that CDMO specifically try to utilize every square or square, um, square meter of, of space inside the clean rooms um, in order to you know, put in more equipment, be more versatile, and, and this kind of unit allows you to do that, along with you know, an automatic control system, and then the, the disposable element allowing you to, to really um, you know, utilize the, the time efficiency rather than, than cleaning and validating it that way. And then just uh, towards a, a project management perspective, you know, provide a turnkey solution with with VHP, um, RTP ports, you know, particle monitoring. Um, the capex is much lower than hardwall systems, as you can imagine. With having film inside, uh, you really are um, looking at a big benefit on a capex point of view. And then opex, you know, depends on your your company's view towards operational costs. But if you're a CMO, it's generally just back charge the to the, the customer that you have. Um, but you do have to consider um, that these units can also be used, you know, permanently. You don't have to have the single use assembly. You know, you can use them all year with the same film. You know, the, the film is fully compatible with VHP. Um, so you can use it. And then the delivery time short, they're on about a 16 week lead time. So it's realistically a, a system that's easy to, to provide for us. Um, 
And then it's a fully compliant system. You know, the, the biggest thing about, about payment systems, I would say, especially in the sterile manufacturing world, is they must be compliant. Um, you know, you'll find there are a lot of local chop shop manufacturers or, or local um, local shops that will provide a, I don't want to call them knockoff pieces of equipment, but are they necessarily compliant to the industry guidelines where you are eventually selling your drug product to? And that's one of the biggest things is consider who your customer is, you know, who are you making this product for, who is consuming this product? And those are the guidelines that you have to be following. And they may be different to the region that you're working in. Um, they may be different to other regions in the world. However, the final region of consumption is where you're really looking at being compliant to. And as this product is, is compliant with both North American and European factoring um, guidelines, as I said, that generally stems through to the rest of the world matter where you are manufacturing drug product for working with a client system. Now, I think I just hit just about an hour, so that's pretty good. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for listening and attending today. Um, I think I woke up, you know, kind of quite quickly in the beginning of that one. It's still like um, five to five in the morning, but I think I've done pretty all right with it. And um, yeah, <clears throat> again, thank you very much. Really good attendance uh, today. And, and thank you for the questions that we're just about to go through. Um, and if anybody wants to answer any, uh, sorry, ask any further questions based on the answers to these and keep them going, as, as Linda said before, you can unmute, unmute yourself and I will try my best, uh, you know, based on my experience um, to, to answer them for you.